I want to continue on tonight, and uh, we, we've been going over this, this idea, and not just this idea, but the reality of the fact that we've been made in His image. We've been made in the image of God, and every single person uh, that has ever existed has had traits of God within them, characteristics of God, and even those that reject God uh, or do not acknowledge him, there are traits that are within them that are of God. And um, it is important that we as uh, children of God uh, recognize some of these things and that the fulfillment and the, the fullness and the potential of who we can be in Christ uh, are demonstrated and become reality in our lives. Uh, I've read this passage a number of times the last few Wednesdays uh, from Genesis 1.26. And uh, God, and I'm talking uh, Elohim, the, the plural God or the God that, there's, uh, that is triune, uh, said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. And so we... We recognize that we were made in the image of God. There are th traits about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that uh, would be within us. And uh, last uh, time, I, uh, I spoke on one of these traits, and that's the trait of relationship and a desiring of relationship. Within each one of us is the desire to have fellowship uh, with others. And uh, sometimes it's to a greater extent. Uh, and sometimes to a lesser extent, but all of us, we desire relationship. And not only do we desire relationship with others, we also desire, desire relationship with God. And in fact, our spirit, the part of, or one of the traits of God, the fact that he's a spirit, uh, within us is also a spirit and a soul that is eternal and uh, desires our spirit desires relationship with God. Our spirit does. And um, that there would be a uh, recognition of that desire and that there would be relationship with God. If you missed uh, last week's uh, uh, session, uh, just check it out on our website or on lighthouseniagara.com. And uh, it's titled Made in His Image for a Relationship, and that's part two. Today, we're going to look at the aspect of the creativity uh, and the design that God has for us. And there's so much that can be said. We can go into so much detail. Uh, and uh, so today, I, I don't want to um, ex go through all the different things. In fact, I'm just touching, even uh, tonight, I'm just touching on it. But um, we need to recognize that who we are in Christ and through Christ, and even those that don't follow Christ, uh, there are parts of who we are that are very good, and there are potential for uh, being um, this uh, extended and expanded upon and multiplied within our life. Uh, the potential, once again, that that we have in God and who we are and the design that, that he's made us uh, to be is, is very much of God. Uh, I think for, for de the designer aspect of who uh, he designed us to be, uh, it doesn't take much. Uh, even as I look around here, I recognize that things didn't just come to be out by chance, but there was a design that took place within them. If I look at the things of, of uh, just a simple thing of, of these rows of chairs, I recognize that there was a certain design to uh, the, the placing of those chairs. One of them w is for the ease of you to, uh, to see me. Obviously, you're all facing me. It's a good thing that uh, the chairs aren't, aren't, aren't all turned backwards, but you're all facing me. And so we have this simple thing of... of organization and design that somebody chose to say, well, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to set up the chairs. When I look at um, uh, 
the, the equipment that's being used here tonight, whether it's the lights, uh, whether it's sound, whether it's uh, the recording, the instruments, all of these things, there was a design that took place. And I know there's there are people that designed and uh, initially, and there's an enhancement on their design uh, for the just the, the the thing of light lighting. Um, the efficiency of lights has become uh, way more uh, advanced and extreme. The amount of power that is used is way down from before because of design and because of improvement upon design. And uh, just the power, when we first got into this place, the amount of power used to uh, generate light in, in this place was way more. I think it's about, I don't know, 20% uh, if not less power being used to light up this room than there was initially when we first got here years ago, decades ago. And um, once again, design. We recognize things don't come about by chance. There is a designer. The greatest creation of God on this planet, what do you think it was? The greatest of all creation. Sorry? Yeah, man. There is, uh, there are so many amazing things that have been made that, that even in this fallen world, I look and I'm just blown away by the design and the mind of God that spoke things into existence in his, in his mind, in the mind of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the speaking. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It talks about life. It talks about light. It talks about this Word and being the Word being made flesh. Jesus always existed. And things, everything that is and exists was made for him and by him and through him. And we have the existence of amazing things on this planet when we think of uh, just the, the order of the universe and everything very intricately moving and intertwined together. Yet the greatest of God's creation, all these things, all the things were, were made and spoken into existence and it was good. Spoken into existence, but the thing of man was formed by God with his hands. Adam was formed by God. And uh, man came into existence. A few things about the the amazing aspect of who we are. And uh, today in this intricacy and this uh, amazing uh, existence that we have and who God has made us to be, uh, we, we recognize the greatest part of our existence being life. And I'm going to expand on this uh, next time. Uh, but I'm going to just touch on these th this thing of life. And regarding the uh, life, we realize how intricate our existence is. And um, I just, I pulled up a few things. I've, I've done this in the past, just pulling up what are some amazing things. I'm going to list off a few things. And you can, maybe you've, you've found something that's amazing about your body, but a few things that I didn't know. But uh, did you know that... Uh, or what, did you know what the largest, what is your largest, the largest bone in your body or bones? The femur, okay? So that's the upper uh, bone in our, in our leg is called the femur. And uh, I didn't know this, but uh, ounce for ounce, it's stronger than steel. So it's stronger than steel, ounce for ounce. Um, and it can take, it can support 30 times our body weight. So our femur can actually support 30 times our body weight. So if you weighed uh, uh, 200 pounds, uh, I guess a bone before it snaps would be, would be able to take 30 pounds or 30 times 200, which would be 6,000 pounds. We're talking uh, three tons uh, of weight that it could potentially support. Did you know that the message uh, that it goes, f that travels from the human brain uh, through the nerves, travels at a speed of 
over 300 kilometers per hour. 322 kilometers per hour is this uh, is uh, the, the 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 speed of of, for instance, me touching just the edge of this pulpit, recognizing I've I've touched the edge, and I've there's this aspect of smoothness and straightness about it. The the information is traveling from my fingertips to my brain uh, at over 300 kilometers per hour. Do you know which bones uh, are where most of your bones uh, are and which part of the body? Sorry? Your hand? Skull? Okay, in the human or in the adult human, 25% of our bones are in our feet. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, fairly amazing. I didn't, I didn't know that. just found that out today. Did you know that human ears and, and the nose never stop growing? So the older you get, the bigger your nose and the bigger your ears will be. They never stop growing. Yeah. And that's true. So keep, if you measure... You measure your ear today, in a year it'll be a little bit longer or a little bit bigger. Same thing with your nose. Yay. Um, did you know there are more bacteria in your human and our human mouth than there are people in the world? So there's over 8 billion people in the world. Did you know there's more than 8 billion bacteria in your mouth, just in your mouth? Yay. Makes you want to just go and brush your teeth, doesn't it? Um, of all the fingers in your hand, which one contributes uh, over 50% of the hand strength? Which one of your fingers? Thumb, index. Actually, believe it or not, it's your finger, your pinky finger. Supposedly, that's what they're saying. So, uh, I didn't, I've got a footnote, but I don't have. It just says number 19, which is the 19th uh, footnote, but I don't have the footnote, so, but we'll just trust them, uh, saying that that's, that's the case. Okay, it would take someone typing 60 words per minute. How many of you took typing in high school? Okay, you older folk, you did. You guys would say, what? Are you kidding me? Did you know... Did you know grade nine typing was the best, one of the best courses I took? I never used it in high school, but once I got to university, we were writing papers using a typewriter. And uh, so in grade nine, I took a course, and uh, I was able to get up to bursts of 60 words per minute. Believe it or not, I couldn't sustain it, uh, but 60 words per minute. And uh, once again, best thing, even to this day, today, I, off, every time I get on, the, uh, on my computer, I can type without looking, uh, just in having the right placement of your hands, the way they taught you uh, in high school back in the 60s and 70s. You guys weren't even born then, but um, it would take me typing full speed without making any mistakes, eight hours a day, around 50 years of typing eight hours a day to type the human genome. So our, the DNA to type it all out, and it's just, uh, I think it's just four different letters, just four le different letters uh, representing um, these, these chemical, pro I think proteins or, or whatever, um, and uh, so uh, adenine, thymine, A, T, G, what's the other one? Anyways, there's four of them, okay? This is going way back. But, yeah, 60 words per minute, eight hours a day, 50 years to just type out the human genome. Yeah, right. It just all evolved um, randomly from nothing. From nothing. Nowhere in anything that even I mentioned today, a simple thing like organizing the chairs the way they are here in, in the balcony, uh, putting everything in place was not random. It was, there was a designer, and the same thing with the DNA. If a human's, human being's DNA were, were uncoiled, 
and stretched end to end, it would stretch out. Just the, uh, the DNA that's in your body or mine would stretch out 10 billion miles, which is the distance from Earth to Pluto and back. Just our DNA, which is, you can, can hardly see it, if we were able to take it and put it end to end, would uh, go 10 billion miles. Um, any idea of how many muscles are used just to take one step? How many muscles? Five? Ten? Twenty? Many. That is a, that is a correct answer. There are many muscles, uh, and there, th there are about 200 muscles that are used just to take one step. 200 muscles. Did you know that the human skeleton, all the bones in our body, renew itself completely every 10 years? Wow. Did you know that the body can detect taste in 0 0.0015 seconds? That's a split second, a, par a portion that's uh, 15 ten thousandths of a second, which is faster than the eye can blink. All right, faster than that. Can it automatically detect? Okay, I'm not tasting anything. Anyways. My hands, yeah, they're, they're so supposed, supposedly clean. Interesting to know how many bacteria I just took in. Um, every hour, humans shed about 600,000 particles of skin, about 1.5 pounds every year. I didn't know that. By the time a person is 70 years old, they will have lost about 105 pounds of skin. Interesting. The brain, the human brain contains 86 billion nerve cells joined by 100 trillion connections. This is more than the numbers of star in the Milky Way. Wow. The lining in a person's stomach is replaced every four to five days to prevent it from digesting itself. Did you know that? Every four to five days, your stomach lining is, all the cells are replaced to prevent them from being digested by the acids that are within the, the lining or within the stomach. Um, a human sneeze can travel about 160 kilomo kilometers per hour, kilometers per hour, kph, or more. Wow. Okay. Anyways, I have a whole whack here. Um, uh, there's, I got four pages of facts. I won't read any more. Oh, actually, there's a funny one, uh, or a few few funny ones. Actually, this one's not so funny as it is a little bit gross. The average human produces 25,000 quarts of saliva in a lifetime, enough to fill two swimming pools. Saliva. Um, there's no young kids, but we know this to be true. The average person passes gas about 15 times a day. Most people try to, to do it privately, but kids of all ages like to share them with friends and family. I thought that was a little bit funny. Anyways, um, interesting. <laughs> interesting. So the potential we have is amazing. It says in Psalm 139, 14, and we're going to look at this chapter a little bit more. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. In this, this psalm, I, there's, this, there's this acknowledgement of God, very much so, by the psalmist. It was inspired by by the Holy Spirit. All scriptures are, are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And uh, David is the, the author of this psalm, this song uh, that, uh, that was written. And he's not opposed to it. He's not opposed to it. In fact, he's in agreement. And we see uh, the agreement uh, and the acknowledgement of God in this chapter, Psalm 139. Just before I get into it, 
I, there's three main questions of life. Say, hey, be good to know these an the answers to these questions. Tonight I'm going to give you answer to these questions. Um, but what three main questions would we have about life, human existence, all of that? Who, who am I? I? Yeah, absolutely. Who am I or why am I here? What, what is my purpose? What is my function? Why am I here is, is one of the questions. Another question, where am I going? Where, where, am, gonna, where am I going to end up? Another question? Or how do I get there? It sort of ties in with that first or that second question there. Now th sorry? Right? That was mentioned. What, why am I here? My purpose? One more question. That, that the world is so adamant about. I guess tied in, it sort of would tie in with that. Where did I come, where do, how did we get here? Where do we come from? And according to this world, we came from absolutely nothing. We just happened by chance to evolve to who we are and what we are. Uh, so these three questions, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Uh, I'm going to, I want to go through this answering mainly the first question, touching on the second and third, and I'll go, go into more detail uh, in the next uh, week uh, on the sec or these th last two questions, why am I here and where am I going? So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, where did I come from? Uh, I just w I want to touch in on Psalms 139, Psalm 139, and I, I want you to, um, once again, just take note of the acknowledgement of God in all of this, of where we came from, and the extent of his um, interaction and involvement of who we are, of who we are. So take note as we just quickly go through this, this chapter. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. God knows you. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. So every uh, part of our daily routine, the Lord knows. The moment you sit down, it's been a long day, and you're tired, and you're just taking a break and sitting down, you know the Lord knows when you say, okay, I need a break. He knows the moment you get up at, at, uh, in the morning, and he understands even your thoughts from afar off. It's like, I'm just, I'm just gazing at you. Even from afar off, I know your thoughts. I even know your thoughts from afar off. This is the God, this is the God that we need to know, that we need to acknowledge in our lives. Where did I come from? Well, let's continue on. You comprehend my path and my lying down. Path is, is, a, is the walk that we would have each day, the steps we would take, the things we would do in our day includes our path. And not only do you know our path, you comprehend our path. Why we go where we go and do what we do, the Lord comprehends our steps on a daily basis. You comprehend my path and my lying down even when we go to bed and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You know me. You know me. God knows you. Our conduct, our speech, everything about us, he knows our intentions, our motivations, our ways, our heart, he knows us. Say, God, do you know me? If you would ask, God, do you know me? He's saying, I know you. I know you very well. And the amazing thing is, 
God is there to keep us. If it was up to the enemy, the enemy would destroy us. We would not be in existence if it was up to the, the enemy, Satan, the accuser of the brethren. But it says, you have hedged me be behind and before and laid your hand upon me. And I want to say this, that even when you were not serving the Lord, a number of you may have come to the Lord at a later time in your life. You weren't necessarily a child. You may have known of the Lord. You may even have gone to church as a child, but some of you did not come to know the Lord until you were adults. And even when you were apart from God and even doing your own thing, God hedged you in to say, I know you, and I don't want for there to be any harm that comes to you. How many of you have ever known or had uh, experiences where you recognized I should have been dead. Okay, I had uh, Brother Anil driving me with, with me, yes, or last week, and uh, he was saying, <laughs> there was two instances, it's like, didn't, it was like, oh my goodness, now, I, I maybe wouldn't have been dead, but there would have been an accident, it was like, what? One was I was shifting from the two lanes heading in the same direction, and shifting over from the inside lane to the outside lane. And so I had looked in my, my mirror, and I had looked over my shoulder. It was nighttime. It was kind of dark, and this, the car was very small. I don't know. It was really small. It was a mini compact vehicle. And uh, I the lights, it, was, it wasn't it was even in, in the blind spot of my mirror. It was sort of close, and I went to go over, and I did another double take, and I don't know if there was a beep of the horn or what, but recognized at the last second I swung back, and it was like, okay. Like, just even the things of accidents, and even in, in accidents, you've been in an accident, and you recognize, oh, my goodness, this could have been so much worse. It says here, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. And I would say that even for the un believer. For the unbeliever, God says, no, no, no. Satan's not taking you out. I always wonder why you have, I mentioned this before, why do you have so many nursing homes with people that have abused their body for not just 80, but 90 plus years, and they're still alive? You wonder, why is that? They should have died long ago, and it's because God has hedged them in because they're not right with him yet. They are not right with God yet, and God is saying, I'm going to protect that individual because my heart and desire is for them to spend eternity with me, and they're not ready. If they, if they should die today, if I should say, hey, that's it, the last you've beat, your heart is beaten, the last heartbeat of tens of thousands of heartbeats in one lifetime, I'm keeping you alive because if you, your heart should stop now, you will be apart from me for all eternity. He hedges us in. This is where now there is an admiration of God, an acknowledging of God. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I don't understand. It boggles my mind. This knowledge of who you are, the fact that you would even consider me to know me, to get to know me, to know all about me, even to the point of when I get up in the morning, you know such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. It's beyond me. I, I cannot attain it. I can't even comprehend it. And the part that God is with us, he desires to be close to us even when we are, we're distant from him. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. In the worst of places, in the worst of times, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, go as far as I can in, in the east part where the sun rises, as far as I can be, you are there. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night 
shall be light about me. Even in darkness, when, when times, now we can talk about this being physical, physically, a physical darkness, but even in a spiritual darkness or in a place of darkness of our lives, we're in a dark place. And surely God doesn't know where I'm at. God doesn't know where I'm going, what I'm going through. He doesn't understand what I'm going in this place of darkness. It says, even the night shall be light about me. As dark as it may be, it is like light about me and to God. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The night shines as the day when it comes to God. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. It doesn't matter whether I'm in the sun in the light or in the darkness, God sees us. He knows where we're at. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. From the beginning, God was there. Where did we come from? I'll tell you right now. It was the mind of God that desired your existence and and fashioned and formed you even when you were being formed in your mother's womb. The moment at the point of conception, they say, when does life begin? It's interesting that life to the person that doesn't acknowledge God, they're not sure when life begins. God is saying, right from the beginning, I knew that you would exist. And from the beginning, let's, let's see what he says. You covered me in my mother's womb. You protected me in my mother's room, womb. I will praise you, once again, in admiration and acknowledgement, the glorifying of God. This is what God would have us to do, is glorify him. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I, I just want you to know, so often the enemy, he's there to... Uh, put down who you are, to, to point out the flaws, the failings, or the, the things that, that we look at ourselves, and, and, and even as, as we might examine ourselves and say, I don't like this about myself, and the enemy is right there to say, yeah, you know what, you're no good. It says here, not according to God. It says, and he, here even David the psalmist acknowledges, I, I'm going to praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You made me. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows well, very well. Your works, and he's not just talking about any works. He's talking about the work that, he, that God did in him and on him, who he was. And he's saying this to each and every one of us. And we, as we would look at others, we need to recognize that people around us are made in the image of God. God made, made them, allowed them to exist. We were, we, were ex we were made to exist by God himself. We were created for God. And that there would be an, an ex acknowledging and a praising of him. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, even from the dust, made, fashioned, you were formed. Your eyes saw my substance, my bones being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Even before the day, one day had been done, in the moment of the formation of my, my existence, when my existence began, you're, there is a book. There is a book and there was already, there is writing in that book that God has about us. Can you imagine? Let me read that again. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. I, I wasn't even born yet. There's already a writing every moment, every day about me. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they should be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. I like this, this phrase here. When I awake, I am still with you. 
to me, it sounds like a choice that the psalmist is making himself. It's to say, Lord, you're with me, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're with me and I'm with you as well. The choice that he's making, I need God in my life. I want God in my life. When I awake, I'm still with you. I'm with you, Lord. You know me. You love me. You care for me. I'm with you. Where did I come from? When it comes to who we are, are the designing of us, the making of us, we came from the mind and, and even the, the word of God spoken. Dave is going to exist. Yeah, he's going to be born on this day. I'm going to, yeah, on October 14th, 1963. I just share that with you. Just keep that in mind when my birthday comes around next month. He knew. He knew that I would exist. He knew that you would exist. The choice I make, I'm still with you, Lord. I'm going to stay close to you. For those that are opposed to God, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, those that would come against us, the righteous. For they speak against you wickedly, against God. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies because they don't love God. There's a strong thing, a strong sentiment here by the psalmist. When it comes to justice, and we might say, you know what? Oh, you know what? There are some people that are so wicked and so evil. Justice will be served. And God, it's only the mercy and grace of God that would even keep them alive at this point. But justice will, is meted out every, every single day. As, people says, as God says, that's enough. No more. It's done. And this, uh, this psalm ends off with a request. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. Lord, check, my, check me. Ex examine me. You know me. Examine me. And it's almost like the, the psalmist is saying, listen, if there is something that you find, you let, need to let me know. Let me know what needs to change in my life. Let me know what needs to change about me so that it would not be displeasing to you. See if there's any wicked way in me that it would be removed. Let me get rid of it. If I'm not aware of it, let me get rid of it. And lead me in the way everlasting to have eternal life. And so there's a surrender to God as there should be in our lives. A yielding before the Lord. Let nothing be in me that is contrary to you. Lead me to an eternity with you. I want an eternity with you. This uh, passage talks about where we've come from, who, the God that knows us so well and where we've come from, and we are of him, and things of our lives and also our eternity. Where are we going? It speaks of all three things. Truly, one of the, the main purposes is that we would glorify God. We can acknowledge God and glorify him. So truly, where do we come from? Well, I, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made by you, Lord God. Marvelous are your works, how you fashioned me, that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. What is our purpose? Ecclesiastes. 12 is one huge experiment, life experiment. And uh, Solomon, King Solomon, had the time, he had the power, and he had the finances to uh, make sure that this came to pass. This uh, huge experiment to, to happen. And he concludes the experiment of life. In the last few verses of the last chapter of Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. 
this science, this experiment of life. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Fear God, acknowledge him, recognize him, and obey him, love him in keeping his, com his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We will once stand, one day stand before God that there would be nothing that would separate us from him. And we know that that is only possible through Jesus Christ. Because we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And it is only by Jesus Christ that we can come and spend eternity with him. Jesus said to him, when it comes to the purpose of life, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That there's a vertical connection. We've been talking about this vertical connection and praise and worship and, and acknowledgement to God. And there's also this horizontal thing of not just loving God, but loving your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 13, 20, and 21, God is the one that desires his will to be done in your life through Jesus Christ. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will through working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. His heart and desire is for his will to be done in your life, the perfecting of his will in your life, and it is through Jesus Christ, the one that died for us. Hallelujah. To him be glory forever and ever, and amen. That is the heart of God for our purpose, why we exist. God, let your will be done in my life. Let my life bring Jesus Christ glory. Let him be glorified. That is, our pur that is his purpose for us. That is why we are here. Where are we going? We are going to one of two places. We're going to either spend eternity with God in heaven, and on this earth, or we're going to spend eternity apart from God. And God, his heart and desire is that we should be with him. Hallelujah. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. For where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. God wants us, Jesus Christ wants us to be with him for eternity. And Thomas says, Lord, do, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We cannot get to heaven except through him. We cannot have a father or come to the father except through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You cannot be good enough. You cannot work your way into heaven. There is only one way. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The carnal mind, the human mind is enmity, is opposed to God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The, God, the, the mind that is, is without God is contrary to God. And, the, and you recognize that as you uh, come in contact with people, as you talk to them, as you, as you spend time with them that are not of God, you recognize that their mind and their thinking is opposed to the God, even to the existence of God. There's always a questioning. There's a questioning of, does God really exist? I don't think so. And there's, a, a, there's oftentimes uh, an attempt to say, well, if God is such, why does he allow these things to happen? Why does this happen if there is a God that loves? There's always this opposition to the things of God. Because the carnal mind is enmity, is opposed against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. In Romans 1.16, right to the end of the chapter, it says, For I am, ashamed, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, the religious, and also for the Greek. 
the intellectual. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, those that are right before God, shall live by faith. Now, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So the things of, of God are revealed and shown to them, and they repress the truth in unrighteousness. Not just suppressing the truth, but they do it in unrighteousness, wickedly. And so the wrath of God is coming against them. In fact, we know already at this time that the wrath of God has come against man by the decisions they make even on this side of heaven. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When I look at the things of creation, it's like amazing, even in a fallen world. Just at the beauty of things. The other day we were, yesterday, wow, we were coming home from uh, Kingston, and it's normally just over a four-hour drive. Well, we were stuck in traffic because of an accident on the Burl Burlington Skyway. And so we were going through Burlington. In fact, at one point, it's like, okay, you know what? I need to go to the washroom. I got out of the car, walked for over almost a mile there to find a washroom and get back the vehicle. And in that time, my wife had moved 250 meters. She was worried that, are we going to meet up again? Or, or, are we going to? Anyways, it was like uh, she had moved literally. I think it was even less than 250 meters in that time. And while we were waiting, actually while we were waiting in these two hours, we were in this one section of Burlington and we were down this one side street, and we were stuck in front of the house, one house. I took numerous pictures of it. It was an older house. And, uh, man, what a beautiful house. The house itself was beautiful. And also, the, the, the landscaping, the, the trees, the shrubs, the plants, the flowers. And I'm saying, man, this isn't a fallen world. I'm thinking, this, what a beautiful place. Like, it wasn't a, 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 a huge, huge house. It wasn't a modern house. It was an older house. I'm sure it was potentially 100 years old. But I'm thinking, this, this is amazing, the world that we live in. The flowers, the trees, the shrubs, and everything just all coming together to make that place look beautiful. And so God made his invisible attributes to be clearly seen. And the image of God is seen in us as we just say, you know what? Like some of the, the, the things that we can create and design are just amazing. I look at, at some of you and, and, and the things, and I know if I, I looked at all of you very closely, there are things about you perhaps that I don't know, but it's like, man, God, you did such a wonderful job in designing and creating each one here tonight. The attributes, and they point, they should point to who God is. God, this, this all points to you and who I am and my attributes. The way you've designed me. It says, for since the creation of the, of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. We were made by him in his image. Are his attributes, is who God is seen in us? Are they clearly seen in us? Lord, let who I am show who you are. Bring you glory. That's one of the, that's one of the main reasons that we're here. even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, the unrighteous, are without excuse. 
that they would see Jesus in us. They would be without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So they start worshiping other things. What, hey, this is, this is God. Start worshiping this God. Fashioned by man. And so here is where we see the wrath of God already being poured out. And it's poured out on individuals. Now I would say, as long as they're still breathing, they have a chance to come around. I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. He gives a whole list of negative attributes of sinners and sin. And he says, after all these negative things, and he says, and such were some of you. That's how you used to be. But you were washed, you were cleansed, you were sanctified. There was a change that took place in you by the power of God. But we recognize already that there is this pouring out of the wrath of God on people. Because they choose not to acknowledge him, because they say, oh, we don't want you, God. We don't want you in our lives. Look what happens. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. And, and this word of uncleanness has to do with, uh, in the moral sense, and what is right. He says, go ahead, do what you want to do. He gives them over to the impurity of lustful, profligate, or reckless, extravagant, recklessly extravagant and wasteful in the use of resources. It's just a, a, a waste of time, effort, finances, whatever, all on self and on a, a reckless way of living, and even in the moral sense, and it's all about self and for self, and the impurity of lustful, this lustful living for self. So he gives them up to this uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So even the things that are created, there is a worshiping of the things that are created even by God. We worship those things. Mother Nature. Hey, every every year, I know, used to celebrate Earth Day. I don't know if they still do that in, uh, in, in school. Today is Earth Day. Usually it's in the spring. It's Earth Day. So there's a, there's a glorifying and a worshiping of the creature rather than creator who is blessed forever. The creator needs to be blessed forever and will be blessed forever and is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, dishonorable passions, shameful passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use. This word use has to do with sexually for what is against nature, what is not normal. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves a penalty of their error, which was due. There's a shifting. There's a shifting sexually, dis dishonoring pas passions, vile passions. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased or reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. And now here's a list of all the different things that, that, that are listed because God's given them over to a reprobate mind. 
a debased mind. See how many of these things are happening today. And it's very rampant. Being filled with all unrighteousness. And we're talking about a people that were made in the image of God. If they only acknowledged him, there would be, these things would not be happening in their life. And the thing about these things, it's not just impacting themselves, but it's impacting those around them. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. You say, yeah, we see all of that. This is God just saying, hey, you don't acknowledge me? Go ahead. Go ahead. This, this is who people are without the Lord. This is where even we were without the Lord. This is us without the Lord. This is us without the Lord. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I mentioned a few weeks back where these celebrities were saying that they, they want to go to hell. We want to go to hell. It's been a great place. So much fun in hell. Deserving of death. We're not talking physical death. We're talking spiritual death. To be separated eternally from God. The wages of sin is death. The payment for sin, this practice of sin, is death. God is saying, hey, and that very same verse is saying, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, if we would only grab a hold. In Acts 3.19, and this is to the worst sinner and for their life. It says, repent. Make a turn. A change of heart and a change of mind to abhor sin. To say, I know this sin is, is destroying my life and destroying others. So I'm repenting. I'm turning from it. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Or in other words, turn to God. Now, so just not just a repenting and a turning away from sin, but a turning to God is being converted. I'm turning to God to worship him. That your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. This is like, as my mouth is parched, this is refreshing. It's like, oh, so good. To have a refreshing of life. Say, I don't, I, I don't want that, the things of, of the flesh, the things that are contrary to God. And even as a believer, sometimes we cling to things because of pride and, and unforgiveness and, and whatever the reason may be. And we recognize our lives are of turmoil. It's like, man, I need, I need to repent. I need to make a change of heart and mind. I need to turn and I need to be converted. I need to turn to God, conversion, to turn to God that he is worshiped, that he is glorified in, in my life, that my sins can be taken care of and that there can be a refreshing, a cooling in the presence of the Lord. There's nothing like a, just a, a cool breeze on a, on a hot summer day just to get into a place of refreshment. I was uh, seeing they were playing on the news a few weeks back that the human body, they were saying the temperatures were getting close to the point in some areas on the planet in the la uh, two weeks ago 
basically the temperatures were re running around in Fahrenheit, somewhere between 120 and 130 in the shade. 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. And they're saying it was getting very close. I don't know what, they didn't say what that temperature was, but they're saying it was getting very close to that a person cannot withstand that kind of heat. The refreshing of the Lord in our life. We are refreshed in and through the Lord. This is who we were made to be. To the worst sinner, the Lord is saying, listen, I want for you to turn. Don't continue on that headlong rush to destruction. There's many out there on that highway, but that you would turn to the Lord. That narrow way, that gate through Jesus Christ that we have life. In Acts 3, 26, to you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. This is Peter talking to the Jews this was after they were asking and they were like, this man that you just healed, Acts chapter 3, the man that you healed, how did he get healed and why? As he's preaching and he's saying, to you first, to the Jews, we're telling you, having raised up his servant Jesus, God the Father raised up his son, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. He wants to bless us. The worst sinner, he wants to bless you. I want you to be with me now, is what the Lord is saying, and I want you to be with me for eternity. I have purpose for you now and for all eternity. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not anything that we can work at and do. Oftentimes it's like, the sing of pride. It's, I'm good enough to be in your presence, God. There's none righteous, not one. But we are saved by the grace of God extending to us. We don't deserve it, but he's giving it to us, his grace, if we believe by faith. And we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And that not of ourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, nothing we can do. For we are his workmanship. As we are born of God, we, are, we become his workmanship, even beyond the, our existence. But now to be born of God, to be born of God, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. From the before time began, God said, hey, I knew that you would exist. I knew that you would exist. And this is what I would have you do in your existence. I've prepared beforehand that you should walk in what I've prepared for you from before time began. Lord, let me walk in the fulfillment of your will for my life. Let me walk in that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, not just beginning here on this planet, but for all eternity. Hallelujah. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Where are we going? Where are we going to go? Where do we come from? What is our purpose? And where are we going? How can we know the way? How can we make it? Someone asked at the very beginning. If the purpose in life is to know how we can make it in the end. What is the purpose? Or how do we make it to the end? Jesus said to him, Thomas, and to each of one, of one of us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Let's just bow our heads. I want to pray that our lives would bring him glory today. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight, Lord, that doesn't know you, or maybe they have strayed from you, Lord, that tonight they'd say, I've gone a long ways from you, Lord. I've done things that I shouldn't have done, things that I know that are wrong. They not only hurt me, but they hurt others around me. And I acknowledge that I have sinned. I'm a sinner. And I also acknowledge you, God, Jesus Christ. I acknowledge you. Father, you sent your son to die for us. You gave your only begotten son. You gave your son. Jesus, you came and died for us all our sins being placed upon you. You took the consequences of our sin, and we acknowledge that. And Lord, we are saying to you, we acknowledge you, we, we praise you, we worship you, because you have given us life. And not just physical life, that we are in existence and we're breathing here. But Lord, you are offering us spiritual life through your son, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that tonight. And we ask you, Jesus, to be a part of our life, to come into our life, not just a part of our life, but our life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Come into our life. Come into our existence. And Lord, that we would be born of you. Lord, I pray you would be glorified in our existence. The purpose, the reason that we live. Lord, God, that your will would be accomplished in us and it will, be, it, it will bring Jesus glory. And Lord, we are in agreement with this. Lord, let our lives bring your name glory. Jesus, your name be glorified in us. You receive all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let it be. And Lord, we just, we thank you so much. We thank you for the life that we have in you and through you. And Lord, as the psalmist acknowledged you, affirmed you, worshipped and praised you, Lord, we do likewise. We thank you for making us. We thank you for the life you've given us. We thank you for our purpose. We thank you for our eternity. We know where we're going. We know what we have in you. We just say, thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're, we were made in your image. And we give you glory in who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a good night. Just a reminder, it is Ladies' Night Out. So if you can, uh, ladies, uh, take that time to join each other and have some fellowship together. The Lord is good. God bless. Thanks for joining us for the sermon. We really hope that God spoke to your life. You can find more of the Word of God by watching our live stream service and listening to our podcast on our website, lighthouseniagara.com.